it's apparently, <laughs> apparently there's some competition about best Christmas outfits. So I just, I want to let everybody know I've got my kitty cat. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I uh, couldn't see that. Sweater I, I, on. I know I, I, I cropped things that. in a little bit, but I, you know, I wanted to make sure everyone understood that I am wearing a Christmas I'm sweater. I'm so underdressed. <laughs> <laughs> You might say you're overdressed. You're the one wearing a button down. Like yeah, I'm wearing pajamas, so I am the one. <laughs> All right, let's uh, talk from Chad and uh, Kai and Brian. You plus one Chad's request here. So you guys want to hear us talk about zero trust environments, software defined perimeter. Have any of us worked on this stuff? Do we have any thoughts here? And, uh, and you'd also love a heavy networking episode on software defined perimeter chat. And yeah, you're not the first one that's asked that. Um, we, as an emerging term, we've, we've, um, there's a bunch of vendors glomming onto that, but we haven't dove in exactly. Um, uh, okay, so first of all, anyone in this crowd, have you worked on it, have an opinion about it, something you'd like to share on uh, software defined perimeter zero trust? I'll get us started mostly on a vocabulary question. Um, do you find, does the group as a whole find that everyone has a different definition of it? Um, like to me, getting so close to the DevOps space for a while, for a few years there, I expect that to mean that the application does not trust anything outside of it. And when it makes calls, no matter what transport it's going across, it, it maintains its own security defense. Mm -hmm. And then I see other folks saying, oh, the network's going to do it. And I'm like, what? Like, I, I completely lose it because now we have all these middle boxes cropping up, doing inspection and doing these kinds of things. And I just don't see the value in it. So I've, I'm curious what other perspectives po folks are saying, what is zero trust? Um, it's a loaded question, but it's like the same thing. Like, I, I think of Inigo Montoya saying, I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> I think it all depends, like you said, on your on your your perspective and context. What what portion of the stack are you most concerned with, and that's where you're going to apply your zero trust lens to. So I was on a I, I helped write an RFP response for a company that wanted to do zero trust networking, all the way down to all the endpoints like their desktops and tablets into the server. So literally everything that hit the switch needed to go backhauled in, in their world they wanted all backhauling to a firewall for inspection um, and that was their concept of zero trust and so there's a certain amount of education we had to do with them that that's not exactly what it means to be zero trust there's you can do things with certificates so not everything has to be inspected because they were looking at these firewalls that were oh god they were like a million dollars a piece to backhaul all of this traffic through them um, so that was pretty it, and it traps you into this brutal architecture. So, oh, like, yeah. Oh. Ooh, I, I just see the, the monstrosity of having to basically break encryption everywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it's literally, if the network's going to do it, it's literally what you have to do. And then the, the need to rotate keys and re encrypt everything and keep control of that. I, I just think about it, like most folks can barely do it on like a single F5. And <laughs> I'm like, hold on, you're going to do this across the entire campus, the WAN, the data center, it, everywhere? Okay, like uh, show me. There, there's I, a I'm reason. A, I'm skeptic on that one. There's a reason that project never got off the ground. Like I think mm -hmm. they got five RFP responses from when I talked to someone who left the company afterwards. And uh, none of the responses measured up to what they want. They're all way more expensive than they had planned out to be and they just ended up scrapping the whole project because they had um, unrealistic expectations of what was possible on their budget um, but also probably unrealistic expectations about what they actually needed from a security standpoint and I, I kind of lean more towards what you were saying Tommy with having the application not trust the underlying infrastructure and have it handle its own security to a certain degree store its keys and encrypt everything at rest and in transit within the application as opposed to relying on the constructs provided by the networking or the storage subsystem or the, the compute. Um, and that's, I, I've seen things moving in that direction depending on who's doing the development. Yeah, Chad uh, just added to the chat here that he's seeing the concept of zero trust network um, being sold as a, as a VPN replacement, which is kind of more the way I've heard different <laughs> folks talk about it. 
it's in the context of user admission, you know, and bringing them on the network and how do you get them on the network in a, in a particular way. And it's, it's zero trust. We don't trust anybody, but we're going to bring you on. And then through, it's kind of like glorified knack is, is yet another way I've heard the market describe this or some market people go after this. Yet another project type that always <laughs> seems to be underfunded, overcomplicated and never gets completed. So, so what's interesting is you talk about you talk about middle boxes. Is I saw some research pretty recently. I wrote about it on my blog. I think that something like twenty percent of all TLS sessions are man in the middle, or some crazy number. Oh wow! So it's it's a much larger number than I expected when I first looked at it. I was like, what? <laughs> really? That's crazy. But it is. It seems like a the lot thing of that it most is. people don't take into account. There, I only discovered this recently. Is virus scanners. A lot of wire scanners on Windows intercept yep. or man in the middle the SSL session so mm -hmm. they can scan the stuff. That, so then everything is, mm. um, ba a lot of traffic then looks like it's actually being man in the middle when it's actually not. Um, you could ask yourself whether those virus scanners are actually good decisions because often they're free. They're and not. as we discovered <laughs> recently, companies like Avast are actually collecting data and then selling it. So they sell all of your web page history, all of that, off to somebody else. In fact, um, it's actually a very good corporate intelligence leak, a data yep. leak. Yep. Companies yep. out there can buy the data from your Avast and then actually measure up to see if you're a viable enterprise IT customer or not, as the case may be. So I think um, the, the man in the middle thing is, is misleading because a lot of virus scanners do the interception. It's not actually a real number at large and a lot of it's corporate. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the thing about zero trust at the end of the day is it has to be in the app, not in the operating system. Right. Right. So exactly. Most of the this, zero trust. You see the so rise of the, DOH and, and uh, that being used in all the browsers to keep even DNS queries encrypted away from the operating system. So that would be an example of how that's happening. But I think I totally stepped on Tom's toes on that one. Sorry. <laughs> that's that's all right. No worries. No worries. Now, what I was going to say, I think this is, you know, the, the general move away from using the network as the point of trust where we used to have the, you know, the the fortified network that sat in the office that was completely trusted and anybody on it was completely trusted to a world where people are working from anywhere from their phone tablet wi-fi 3g hotel wi-fi whatever it is and you can't rely on the underlying network to to do the the work for you um and vpn has been such a hassle for users generally that we're moving further and further away from it so going down to the self-defined perimeter is pushing that trust back into the apps as we go more and more into using SaaS services and things like that. It's, that's where it's moving. It's the authentication point is going away from the machine and the network into the user and the application instead. Um, and that's only going to continue that trend as we go forwards. I think it's important to remember that VPNs were about adding encryption to unencrypted traffic. They were that was their primary purpose with some authentication. They weren't actually meant to change the security posture of the organization. You had all this unencrypted HTTP and Word documents and printer traffic. And the point of a VPN was to, today we have HTTPS everywhere. So mm -hmm. most remote access VPNs can just be replaced with TLS and we're done. You know, if you HTTPS enable your web app and put an authentication window on it, you've just replaced your IPsec VPN from start to finish logically. So if you can apply HTTPS authentication to every one of the applications that your organization uses, you've then got zero trust because everything gets logged in. Now that's the simple story. The hardest story of course, is that your environment is full of printers and they don't log in right? <laughs> and nobody logs into the printers, right? Or you've got door locks or some sort of environmental system that was built 30 years ago and nobody's going to replace it to use zero trust. So get the gap is what, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's solutions for that stuff. There are there's solutions. So uh, Aruba, I've seen some presentations from them recently where they're they're tackling this, and they have answers for all of this. I, I'm you know I'm mm -hmm. being hesitant to say there are solutions for this because there are products that uh, purport to tackle these problems, how well they work because a lot of them are new and emerging and are maybe solution specific or have a significant hardware dependency or, mm -hmm. you know, these kind of things. There's always these big asterisks about how effectively they're going to work for you or what investment you have to make to get this total package that are going to give you that answer. But it's not like that's, that's unknown. And, you know, that is a thing. Um, that, that is being tackled by vendors. How deep are you into their ecosystem? Um, yeah. How deeply do you want to go? 
Yeah, some of them do zero trust and identify the printers by their traffic and their MAC addresses and they fingerprint yep. it. And then they say that is a trusted device. And if it gets out of profile, like if it starts sending traffic that's not printer traffic, then it's not to be trusted. Is that zero trust? That's, uh, you know, it's edge networking of a sort. So, you know, it might be sufficient zero trust to get you a step further down the path. It would be better if you just took all your printers and threw them in the bin. Yes, but, please do. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you say that as I have a, a networked printer sitting over my shoulder back here because <laughs> I still got to print stuff from now on and on again. It's terrible. Oh, it's unfortunate, isn't it? In, uh, the, in the paperless age, we have to print so much. It's actually uh, cheaper for me to go up the road and buy a new printer than it is to buy a printer cartridge. Yes. Yeah, That's, I run into the same a, thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, which makes me incredibly sad. I wonder if there's a market out there for retrofitting copiers and printers with some sort of security like dongle on them <laughs> to provide that. I, I, that's, that probably already- Physically exists. man in the middle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I've, I've lost track of it, but, but yeah, there, there was a product like that, Ned, that, like a, um, like that Avaya condom. Networks was yeah. selling. <laughs> yeah, it, it was basically that. It really was. It was based but on Shores Map Bridging. Photoshop that. <laughs> You, you plug oh. your device into the little thing. The little thing was a shortest path bridging endpoint, and uh, that's how you could protect this thing. You know, they were targeting it more for <laughs> medical, where there was some MRI machine that you couldn't, you know, mess with the OS or upgrade mm -hmm. software or anything. And you'd, yeah, you'd stick that uh, network condom, you know, on the end of the cable, ba sure. basically, <laughs> to secure the thing. When you think about what you actually do print to printers, like think about an executive assistant that's printing information about their boss, and that might be highly personal and interesting information that's riding the network, and it's probably not encrypted. I don't know if, uh, if any of the, <laughs> the printer protocols encrypt anything going across the wire. Well, and the interesting part, too, is that the printers often have uh, very large hard drives, multi-terabyte hard drives in them, and they, the jobs actually spool onto the hard drive before they print, <laughs> and quite often they're not cleaned up. So if you throw a printer away, you quite often have to open it up and fish out the hard drive. And I actually have read articles over the years of people who buy printers off eBay or from disposal sites and get the hard drives out <laughs> and look at the documents that have been printed. It's been, yeah. And they're like yeah. ex-military, you know, yeah, that's what. Oh, that's lovely. Good to know. <laughs> now, the question that we originally fielded here was about uh, software-defined perimeter slash zero trust, which I don't think of as the same thing. I mean, they're kind of related, but software-defined perimeter is basically, to me, it's a new way to say, I need remote access to something, you know, from no matter where I am. So maybe they're related, but I think of software-defined perimeter as it's kind of like glorified VPN, or maybe it's a different way to tackle the virtual private network problem, you know, that we used to have. <laughs> glorified VPN. <laughs> well, because that's how some of these companies that have no, pitched me, we're a software-defined perimeter company, and you look at what it is, it's like, oh, so you're an IPsec term, termination service, it's except just, you're in the just, cloud. It's I just the land of the cool. desktop. Uh, I, I, like, I, I've, uh, I've used uh, Palo Alto's Global Protect pretty successfully, and I've seen some mm. advanced configurations of that. I've been pretty impressive, because <clears throat> you have your gateways that you attach to when, when the posture of your machine tells you you're supposed to do that. And so it's having like laptops out in the field or any device really be always on and certain things uh, split tunnel or go different ways. It's been kind of interesting. And I've, I've always kind of wondered, maybe I shouldn't say it out. Maybe it's an idea I should take to a venture capital firm, but why isn't there like a local box you can put on site that can be aware of clients that can bring that SD-WAN multi-transport concept to that? Like, hey, the, I have a client on site and it needs to get to these two data centers because that's their application or into the cloud. And if it had like a waypoint, um, using a term I'm working on right now, if it had a waypoint to hop through that was intelligent enough to use multi multiple paths to protect that conversation, that'd be pretty darn slick. Because if you get to a good posture with Global Protect, you can do some cool stuff. Like, and it's just, it just works. Um, I'm pretty sure it still comes up against the, oh, I forgot my password problems and now I can't get to anything and I'm orphaned and things oh, like I that. I saw an architecture that was like what you're describing, Tommy. Before Oracle bought Talari, they partnered with somebody, mm -hmm. the name of the company I've forgotten, but you basically did a VPN termination to them and then you would interconnect that cloud-based VPN termination service with 
um, your home base over the Talari box to optimize connectivity. So you could jump from there and then go up off into the cloud and be automated and secured. You'd have connectivity back into home base for authentication and logging purposes. And you could um, share out over your Talari connection optimized applications uh, that way as well. Uh, at now Oracle's bought Talari. Who knows what's you know happened with all of that? It's probably all blown up to smithereens. But I mean, yeah, that architecture was a thing that was. Um, I think I think it was roughly a loose integration, is how you describe it. But there was a partnership to try to give you the capabilities that sounded more or less like what you just described. So someone's thinking. And some about of the it. Uh, some of the SD WAN companies are headed in that direction. They're folding the security into the appliance. Yeah. And that already moves a lot of the security right out to the edge of the branch, mm. and. Once it's in a, a branch device, it could also be placed in a switch. Cisco has been trying to do this with um, security SGT, security group tags and SGA for over a decade and not really had a lot of success. Um, they haven't been able to get the endpoint piece to recognize an endpoint to add a tag. They've had the, the piece. But I think some of the SD-WAN vendors are getting closer. It'll be interesting to watch how those vendors, um, with the security focus, they're not focused so much on the WAN piece because that's just core competency now everybody's got a, mm. an sd wan story that does you know dynamic paths and analytics and cloud controllers it's like you know earwax S everybody's S got sd wan to the desktop man yep <laughs> and that is the logical <laughs> and that is yeah. exactly the logical extension of sd wan is it yeah. should be in your smartphone or your laptop or your 5g connected laptop and that's i think that's where it'll evolve to over time and at that point the campus becomes irrelevant right because if every one of your laptops has an sd wan edge client on board then what's the value of a campus network it's all except agents. as a except that it's cheaper than a 5g network do, do you Maybe. think there are categories like this where we have solved and competent solutions out in the field today that work just fine that don't really warrant or need replacement and someone's you know a problem looking for a solution, looking for a problem type stuff. Do you think that's yeah. like incurring upon some of the things we're doing? Because like, so mm -hmm. that's a perfect example I just gave. Like I, I've seen very competent global protect rollouts and I'm like, that's pretty fantastic. Like that pretty much gets the job done on a number of layers. <laughs> and I see other ideas come up and I'm like, eh, implementation pain. Like why, why am I changing something that works well? Like is, is there a chink in the armor I'm trying to solve for or not? And so I, I keep coming up against that seems to just come in like cruise missiles from the side constantly right now. <laughs> and there's a whole Why? different bunch of ways this? to do it as well, right? Because um, you've got Forescout that uses all of the devices Stop in security. the security. You've got yeah, you've got, <laughs> and you've got other okay. people who want to put an agent on Good the answer. edge. You've got other people who want to do inline inspection. You've got other people. There's so many different ways to do it, but we haven't, as an industry, converged on one. And at the mm. end of the day, it's like SD WAN has been around for 20 years, like since the late 90s. But all of a sudden, SD-WAN got its day in the sun, and now we're converging around a form of SD-WAN, which is, you know, automated failover, public WAN, blah, blah, blah. The, qu the question will come is, when does Zero Trust get its day, get its time? Yeah. And I think it's getting closer because we're seeing a lot more, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more beat to that rhythm than there was five years ago. Yeah, it's, it's just so hard to, for me to call Zero Trust something that's net new because we've had NAC forever and we've had micro-segmentation as a very significant data center movement, especially you know recently. And what, what is all of that when you boil it right down? It's Zero Trust. So I, NAC 2.0 wasn't going to get any venture money, but Zero Trust was, so that's what we got. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Oh, exactly right. All right, well, we're coming up on the hour. We don't have uh, any more questions that I've seen unless I miss something. If one of you guys want to punch something in real quick, go for it if you're on the YouTube chat. But uh, I think that's it. Let's, uh, let's give our holiday wishes to the nice folks uh, as we go around the table real quick. And, uh, and wait, Tom Bragg, you're, you're in the UK, right? You're UK based somewhere? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Are there, are there traditional holiday greetings that, uh, that you, were, you, you, you could share? Or is it just Merry Christmas? Is that it? Just, just Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Very Merry good. Christmas. Okay. Is Thanks, it supposed Tom. to be happy Christmas in the UK though? Yes, yeah, that's, that's what I heard. Uh, Merry, happy, whatever. <laughs> Come on, I want the original. Merry, I what, the, whatever the, Christmas. UK, the, UK, the UK version uses Merry because that tends to imply that you might have had a drink or two beforehand. So it's a, <laughs> <laughs> a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you, Greg? You're from Australia. Are there any uh, non-Merry Christmas sort of traditional greetings? You're muted. 
<laughs> Australia, of course, is in the Southern Hemisphere, so it's summer over there. And in fact, right now, it's having its hottest summer on record, perhaps ever. So hmm. apparently down there, it's quite a different lifestyle. I, there's lots of different things down there just simply because it's uh, uh, Christmas Day when I was a family, we would go to the beach and surf, which for most people in the Northern Hemisphere would be like a, just a completely different things about wrong. So no, they don't have a different way of doing it, except maybe have a stubby, which is a type of have a bottle of beer. But for me, I actually am living in the UK. So Merry Christmas to everybody and uh, make sure you come back in the new year. Thanks so much for putting up us in 2019. We'll still be here in 2020. So yeah, we will sucks. be. <laughs> yeah, it sucks to be you. <laughs> Special greeting from you, Russ White. Oh, just Merry Christmas. Come find me on my blog and on my podcast and you know, whatever. I'm around. <laughs> he That's says in his fantastic. understated way rule11.tech and of course he's got the hedge networking podcast which i've been enjoying my favorite from the year from the hedge russ was uh, the two-parter you did with jeff huston tearing apart uh, doh oh, no. that was a great oh, discussion goodness. yeah wow yeah, that was a good one what about you ned bellavance with your crazy shirt uh you know just merry christmas and happy stand holidays. up stand, stand up again up. Oh, you say, right. yeah now you can say it. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, eat a lot of cookies. Uh, that's easily my favorite thing about the whole holiday is all the food. So I'm excited for cookies and other things that my wife and I will make and give to all of our uh, wonderful family. Yeah, I saw on your Twitter feed that you, uh, you had made bread, you enjoyed the cracking sound it made, and then you yes. cut it to show the crumb. I'm like, yes. you, Julia Child? <laughs> oh my God, if you go on Breadit, which is the bread <laughs> subreddit, um, <laughs> If you post a picture of your bread, you also have to post the crumb. Oh, no lie. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. That's crazy. Oh, oh yeah. It's, it's a bit of a problem. But <laughs> our worst habits. Tommy McNichols. <laughs> Tommy McNichols, any special greetings for the folks? Uh, well, I think the next time we do this, we'll have to go through the airing of grievances and the feats of strength. But, uh, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> other than that uh, I don't know. We're a pretty friendly crowd. So you get a Merry Christmas out of me. All right, very good. And Drew, with your pajama shirt. Uh, yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. As I'm looking out my window right now on the East Coast, it is snowing, so very apropos. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, well, not up here. I dealt with that yesterday as I was stuck in airports much more than I was stuck on the airplanes themselves due to some terrible weather. So Merry Christmas from me and from all of us at Packet Pushers. Thank you guys for, uh, for joining. Thanks to those of you that watched. And uh, as Greg said, tough luck for you. We're coming back in 2020. <laughs>